Next, here are some other weird cheese. Uh, Xiongkuden is a pyloric flower. So it's got multiple petals and sepals, and they're all kind of twisted, and they've got some pink in there and a little green in there, and it's a really big flower. The one thing I've noticed, although the different colored flowers are also very fragrant, I can't ever catch any fragrance on this guy. So if fragrance is really important, then I would not get this guy. And then Seikai is, uh, is a really cool little um, samurai bean leaf, really compact plant. This is actually the first one I ever bought, the first Mio I personally ever bought. I fell in love with it. And it's got funky pink flowers. Pink on a bean leaf is very unusual, and then you've got the unusual shape on top of that. So that also is a very uh, popular variety that I'm out of right now. Okay, so just a little bit about um, like the being a Fukuron collector, I guess, and knowing more about Fukuron society. Uh, in Japan, there is an all Nippon Fukuron society, and they uh, they actually rank the different varieties. Uh, to determine who should be considered a Fukiran as opposed to just a Furan. And they have a meeting once a year and they do uh, an auction and a judging and all that kind of good stuff. Now this particular plant, this is Komaru, it's a bean leaf type. This judging did not take place at the Fukiran Society. This was at the Japan Grand Prix show that occurs in Tokyo at Tokyo Dome every February and they do a big judging and this was the number one Fukuron in 2015. So I just wanted you to see what a prize winning plant looks like. Next slide. So let's say that you had, you were a Fukuron collector and you came across what looked like to you a different variety that you'd never seen before. Maybe a seedling that you came across or something and you felt like, this is really special, like, I think this should be considered a Fukiran. How do you get it to be recognized by the Fukiran Society? Well, first you have to grow it up big enough to make three separate plants hmm. and to show that you can get consistency in the plant. And then it has to be potted up beautifully. So here are some examples of, of potting, and actually, although I thought this was really cool looking, this particular one here, that would not be okay in Japan because you should have all of those roots tucked in, you should have them tucked in. Um, but these two would be, that, at least I think, these would be suitable. And notice you've got this raised ball of sphagnum moss. What's going on there? That is the traditional way that these are presented. And I think that it does two things. Number one, when you're talking about a small plant, you want to show it off to best effect. So by elevating it out of the pot, you see the plant better. So I think that's the first thing. And the second thing is, it's a vanda. And vandas like to be able to breathe. So again, by getting it up out of the pot, it lets the roots breathe better. So that, I think it's those two things together, so both aesthetic and biological. Um, so that is how a plant should be presented. So when you have your three plants potted beautifully in a pot that matches the nature of the plant, yeah, I'm not joking. Okay. If the judges say that your pot does not match the plant, you're not going to be judged. Oh. I'm not, yep, yeah, that's the truth. Um, pots and potting, if you were here earlier when we were talking about, about growing, you need to know your own conditions in order to match your pots and potting. But in general, these guys need to get wet and dry out. That's the key. So I grow mine in sphagnum, and I get them wet and let them dry out. You want to wait until that sphagnum gets crunchy, not mostly dry, like crunchy dry. Yeah. 
So that will make them happy. The one exception to that is when they're actually in bloom or when they've got a spike. Then I don't let them dry out completely. Um, but other than that, treat them like a typical vanda. Uh, but I do have them potted. I found they grow better potted than in a basket. Medium, uh, again, I, I love moths. How many people hate moths? Admit it, I know. Okay. So there are no, okay, there are some moss haters here. I know, I know you're out there. I know you're just trying to make me feel bad. I know that. Um, the thing about moss, as I said earlier, people tend to overpack moss. Now, I know when I bought this business and I was helping Glenn repot, he's a packer, man. He's got these giant hands, and he would wrap that sphagnum around there until these guys were strangled within an inch of their life and then shove them down in the pot. And then when we go to pull them out, they're all rotted. You know where all the live roots were? On the pot on the outside. That's right. What you should do, you know that the picture that you saw, those beautifully mounted ones? Mm -hmm. You know that ball is hollow. Yeah. It's hollow. That is a shell of sphagnum. That middle part is all hollow, okay? So what you want to do is think of it as wrapping a shawl of moss around your plant roots. That will make them very happy. So that's me, but you don't have to grow. You, I, anything that you can think of to pot these guys in, I know somebody growing them successfully that way. Light, moderate to low, probably lower than you think, um, unless you've got a golden tiger. If you've got a gold-colored tiger, you want to keep the light up a little bit higher to keep the good gold color. Water and fertilizer. Water. Water very well and let them dry out. Okay, no reason you can't soak them for 30 minutes or whatever. Take them out. See how long it takes for them to dry out. It could be a week. If it's really hot and dry, it could be three days. So just see how long it takes. Um, fertilizer. In Japan, um, well, Glenn had always told me they don't like they don't like very much fertilizer. That's not actually true. They are a vanda, and vandas like to be fed. So in Japan, the growers that I know use a slow-release fertilizer in the pot, and then every month or so they water with either like a compost tea or a fish emulsion or some other low nitri nitrogen fertilizer on top of that. Um, so they do like to be fed, but if you don't like thinking about it, just put a slow release fertilizer in there and you're good to go. Temperature, um, up into triple digits, down not quite to freezing, just to be on the safe side. And I will say, um, you know, you might worry about heat stress, right? You worry about that. I wouldn't worry about it. I had my plants at a show in Pennsylvania, and then I went straight from there down to my mom's. And this was the end of July. And she's in Virginia. And I was a little nervous about it, because we put our plants outside in, in Michigan for the summer, because it seems nice, you know? And I thought, man, it's going to be hot. But we put the plants in the shade for one week. When I got home and I unpacked those plants, I saw new growth on most of the plants. And I immediately took all my plants from outside and put them in the greenhouse, which is a pain for watering, but I just felt like they grew more with the heat. And these growers in Japan, they're in a greenhouse in the summer, and they don't have a cooling system. They got fans, but it's over 100 degrees in the greenhouse. So you guys, you can do this. Um, Let's see. I think that about covers it. Much less fertilizer in the wintertime? Yes, less fertilizer in the wintertime. Okay. Yep, yep, I would cut back on it. How do you fertilize, the, like if it's not in a pot like that, it's in those mounds? Yeah, maybe? yeah. You How know what they do is, um, uh, yeah, because, oh, i got to watch that thing. Um, let's see, do I have a nice mounded one? Yeah, so somebody like this, we can actually put up the lights, Keith, if you want. Okay. This is finished? Yeah, yeah. So 
What they do is, you know what, you know Nutrico? Are you familiar with that? Yeah. Looks like Osmocote, but a little bit bigger. You know Osmocote? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So Nutricote is the same thing. And he just takes the, the Nutricote, he takes five grains. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> so he just sticks it around the outside. And then, you know, like I said, like once a month with the, with the fish emulsion or compost tea. That's the one grower. The other grower has more of a granulated kind, but he does, the, he does this too, and he just pours those little grains right in the side. Now, their pots are not quite so open. Um, one uses clay pots, all clay pots, and the other one has um, more, like, more like this kind of pot. No, more holes down here, but not so much close to the top here. But yeah, they just they just pour it in there. But you don't have to use slow release. You know, you could just fertilize. Yeah, so, I know, slow release is so easy though. I like that. Uh, you need to warn us about overwatering. Didn't you have a friend that oh, overwatered and yes, yes. expensive? Yeah. Well, yeah. So one of my friends had a beautiful neo collection. And somebody came and spoke at their society about neos. And he talked about, oh, you can't hurt it. We can throw that sucker across the room. You're not going to hurt it. I promise you. Um, so, uh, so the guy that came and spoke said, it's, and your neos would enjoy being misted every day. So that's what he did. But he was growing inside. Well, unless you've got a fan blowing on them all the time, you're not going to dry out very fast. Well, guess what? He lost his whole collection, the whole collection, by, you know, trying to do something that works for somebody else. The, if there's a golden rule in orchid growing, it's got to be, if what you're doing is working, don't listen to anybody else. Oh, you know what you got to do? you got to change. No, you got to do what's working for you. Don't change anything if it's working for you. So tell them how I suffocated mine. Yeah, and see, Johnina was worried about humidity, which I'm sure you guys worry about a lot. So she had one of these guys down um, in a in a closed pot. So it was in the open pot, but then in a closed pot, and we think that it just stayed too wet down there. So, uh, you know, it's possible to over baby your babies. That's, well, that's those the real thing. pretty pots are there for show. Not yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, if you, right, if you, if you want to spend money, you can get into Neos. If you want to spend some real money, you can get into the pots that go along with them. <laughs> <laughs> because, oh my god. And they're, yeah, they're gorgeous. But those pots are just for show. You literally show the plants in those pots, and then you put them, you take the plant out and put it into a pot, and you put the pot up on a shelf for display. Mm -hmm. That's how they do it. You remember telling us that when you were here last time, yeah. a, a friend or an acquaintance that had a thousand dollars? Oh, email. yes, well, that's, that's my girlfriend. Uh, Tell them about that. Yeah, the one who doesn't like the purple, she got thousand dollar stripy bean leaf. Okay, thousand dollars, and a month later it was dead. Oh my! Now she grows these, so she's not even sure exactly what happened, but you know it's probably the typical overwatering thing. So a few months later, she got another one. Yeah, same thing. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, she killed it. Um, yeah, she didn't get a third. <laughs> well, I don't even think she knows. She doesn't feel like she knows how she killed it. Mm -hmm. oh. But you know, it, I mean, that's yeah. That's usually it. That's usually it. So I would say that these are very easy to grow if you don't over water. <laughs>